Secretary. Let me pick up on that point. One of the questions from uh, one of the participants in the town hall meeting format at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, was from a Muslim American making the point 3.3 million Muslims living in the U.S. and asking this question. How will you, now this is aimed at Donald Trump, but I'm going to phrase it to you, Governor Johnson. How will you help people like me deal with the consequences of being labeled as a threat to the country after the election is over? Well, I'm not going to label you a threat to this country. I'm going to label you as an asset to this country, just like all immigrants to this country um, are assets. So it starts with a commander in chief that's going to be talking about these issues in particular in the way that I'm talking about, that immigration is really a good thing. This is not a country that should be discriminating against uh, any group whatsoever. Uh, when we do that, uh, it has a bad consequence, and we should be working to uh, overcome that uh, discrimination. And as president, I will work to overcome that discrimination. You probably saw the numbers from the very latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll that has Hillary Clinton now with the lead. This is a national survey among likely voters. You now are at 9 percent. According to the Commission on Presidential Debates, you need to be at 15 percent to participate. There is one more debate. Do you sense any movement that would allow you to be on the stage next week in Las Vegas? Well, uh, anything can happen. Uh, maybe with this uh, showing here on C-SPAN, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, this might push it over the top. But uh, it's, a, it's a hard road to push if you're not uh, in the presidential debates. I take great solace, I take great pride in leading among young people right now. Now, by leading, I guess I'm tied with Hillary Clinton, but coming from nowhere to be tied among young people, I think come Election Day, that could actually swing to um, carrying young people. I'm leading among independents, uh, the largest political identified uh, 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 allegiance right now in this country, and like I said earlier, leading among uh, active uh, military personnel, which although is not a very big demographic, uh, who but they should know what's going on and what direction this country should take uh, militarily. Randall has this tweet, a question with regard to the U.S. Supreme Court. His question, Governor Johnson, what are your top considerations for a Supreme Court judge, or in this case, of course, justice? Well, we actually had a list today that we released, but uh, at the top of that list is um, Jonathan Turley uh, from uh, George Washington University, uh, Tom Campbell, uh, who is a dean at uh, Chapman University. Uh, constitutional, um, constitutional law, uh, looking at the Constitution from the standpoint of original intent. Let's go to Snay, who's joining us from New City, New York, a supporter of Hillary Clinton. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am generally basically an uh, independent mind, but I am leaning toward Hillary Clinton. The reason, you know, I am uh, disgusting uh, with the Trump thing, like uh, he's racist, he's lying every five minutes, and, you know, all these tapes he calling locker room. How about the Howard Stern show, National TV? What kind of bad thing he say? He just wanted to date his daughter, he wanted to make out, all kind of things. Is it that America we stand for? What we can tell our children in the future, you know? I mean, how we can explain them, you know, with these kind of stuff, uh, you know. It's such a, I mean, disgusting things when I feel, you know, what this man, does he know? And like Mr. Johnson just said, like he said that 11 million people he want to deport, how are he going to label them? Knock door to door? Or he's just making a fool of American public? So, you know, those kind of things. A president should have some graceful things and nice words and everything. He gets very revengeful. If things doesn't go in his way, he just gets very revengeful. You, he has a pattern. You may look at Megan Kelly. He got upset. The pastor, the black pastor in church, he got upset. The judge is Mexican. The, 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 the son of the POW, every single person, he has a bad comment uh, for those people. So it is so sad, you know, how this is not the America we want. This is not the America stand for. They have a values.
Nate, you know? thank you. I'm, I'm going to jump in, give Governor Johnson a chance to respond and talk about the overall tone of this campaign. Thank you for your call and your participation. Governor Johnson. Well, I just agree with, I, I would just agree with everything it is that you said about Donald Trump. I would just add that when it comes to Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, there isn't there isn't anything that government won't be able to solve in the future when it comes to uh, Hillary Clinton. She's going to grow government. Neither Hillary nor Trump uh, want to address the entitlements, Medicaid and Medicare, reform the entitlements so they're actually around uh, for young people. I don't think it's an option to say let's do nothing with those programs. And actually, Hillary's saying that we should expand those programs. I don't think it's an option to say that we should not uh, look at reforming Social Security so that it will actually be around for young people. And then I'm particularly disturbed with these latest revelations, which is the hypocrisy of Hillary Clinton saying one thing and doing another, talking to Wall Street uh, uh, privately, telling them that, uh, look, ordinary people don't understand uh, these issues. but. You and I do, and we'll make it through. I think the one unforgivable in life is hypocrisy, uh, saying one thing and doing another. From the town hall meeting on Sunday, one of the participants saying that the Affordable Care Act is not affordable, adding, what would you do to bring costs down and make coverage better? And let me add to that this tweet that we have from Nick, who's also asking about health care. He wants to know about pre-existing conditions. What would you do specifically? So on these two big issues, your thoughts, Governor Johnson? Well, there needs to be reform to the Re uh, Affordable Health Care Act, that we should bring competition. I think government could play a really big role in bringing competition, more competition, to health care. More competition would be ultimately better health care, advertised uh, pricing, advertised outcomes, something that currently doesn't exist. Uh, look, pre existing condition is an issue that this country. Uh, was and is facing, and I think it can be uh, taken care of. And if, if that ends up to be a government subsidy, which currently, you know, it's, it's, it's layered right now, but uh, currently that is a government subsidy at, at present. Uh, but these are, that is a very real issue. Uh, Health care reform, uh, I happen to agree with Chief Justice Roberts uh, that uh, the Affordable Health Care Act is a tax. My health insurance premiums have quadrupled. Uh, I went to see a doctor here about three weeks ago to get a physical because I'm running for president. But until then, I hadn't been to see a doctor for years prior to that. Uh, look, we could bring competition to uh, health care. We, uh, we could blow the lid off the supply of doctors. So much is being made about the fact that there aren't enough doctors to go around. Well, that could be a government subsidy when it comes to uh, medical schools and their ability to turn out more doctors, that we should be dealing with health care from the front end, uh, not after, um, after the consequences of uh, poor diet, uh, no exercise, uh, after the consequences of those uh, ingredients uh, uh, come down then on the, on the health care system. And now we have to deal with diabetes, we have to deal with uh, uh, heart failure, smoking, you know, we have to deal with uh, the consequence of uh, smoking, uh, on and on and on. Um, bring competition, more competition to uh, health care as President of the United States. Uh, I'll sign any legislation that I believe makes health care more affordable and increases a way to, uh, uh, to lower costs. If we opened, for example, if we opened up uh, our ability to buy prescriptions from Canada because they're cheaper from Canada, uh, which I would support in a nanosecond, but how long would uh, prices remain expensive in the United States if we did that? They wouldn't remain expensive at all because that competition from abroad, uh, competition brings about lower prices. Let's go to Darlene. She is a supporter of the Johnson Well ticket in Cincinnati, Ohio. Good evening. Hello, Governor Johnson. I'm um, honored to speak with you. And I was so relieved when I found out about three months ago that we had another option besides uh, Clinton and Trump. Um, and I've been impressed uh, with the information that I've gotten off your website. 
um, especially the the fact that you cut taxes when you were governor 14 times and that you left the state with new highways and bridges and schools and hospitals. And I am uh, a firm supporter and have been telling as many people as I can about you. Uh, I think it's a crime that the the Commission for Presidential Debates has shut you and the other candidates off um, from the debates. I think that is um, worthy of the lawsuit that's been filed against them. And um, I hope that when that lawsuit comes to um, to trial that they'll be found to, to um, have to pay a lot of taxes for the fact that they've been masquerading as a um, nonprofit Darlene, agency. thank you for the yeah. call. Well, one thing that Bill Weld and I are going to bring when it comes to small government is certainty. Uh, taxes are not going to go up. Uh, we're uh, pledging to submit a balanced budget to, to Congress in the first 100 days. Why a balanced budget? Well, a balanced budget is all about the future of this country. A balanced budget is for young people. The fact that I'm going to get my health care, I'm going to get my retirement, uh, but guess what? You as young people, who's to say if it's going to be around? The Affordable Health Care Act that uh, relies on healthy people subsidizing those that aren't so healthy. Well, guess what? That disparagingly falls on young people also. And it's young people that we're putting in harm's way with our military policies, with our, with our uh, intervention regime change policies that are putting young people in harm's way. So I think all of this is really geared toward the future and all of this, the libertarian agenda is Equality for all, you touched on the Presidential Debate Commission, Presidential Debate Commission made up of Republicans and Democrats, and they just have no uh, interest whatsoever in seeing anyone other than a Democrat or a Republican on stage. Amazingly, uh, this is something that I just found out a couple of weeks ago, I'm actually polling higher than Ross Perot was polling when he was allowed into the presidential debates. Now, initially, he was polling very high, then he dropped out of the race. After he dropped out of the race, he was polling lower than I am right now. He was allowed into the presidential debates because uh, both Clinton and Bush saw it as an advantage that he was in those debates. Well, after those debates, the Presidential Debate Commission set a threshold that without being in the presidential debates, a real chicken and egg thing, without being in the presidential debates, you cannot garner that level of support. We are at the midway point of a one-hour conversation with Governor Gary Johnson. He is the Libertarian Party nominee. In our next hour, a conversation with the Green Party nominee and her running mate. And we want to remind our audience that um, the speeches by Governor Johnson from his acceptance speech at the Libertarian Convention on our website. You can check it out online anytime at cspan.org. We welcome our listeners on C-SPAN Radio. And we have a tweet from Jennifer who wants to know specifically about our voting system. She writes, what would you do as president to reform our election process campaigns and voting systems. How do you answer that? Well, I'd very simply like to see just a majority elect the president of the United States. Uh, I, I understand the reasons for the Electoral College, but uh, here it is. We could conceivably have uh, this vote go to the Electoral College. Uh, I think it's outgrown its usefulness. Uh, that, would be, that would be a starter. I also like... Uh, uh, ranked voting, where you where you can vote uh, for a couple of candidates as opposed to one, uh, and um, I think that's a way to break the two-party system also. And when I say break the two-party system, uh, break the two-party system. Democrats, 28 percent. Republicans, 26 percent. Independents, 43. Libertarians, Greens making up the rest. Uh, Really, uh, Democrats and Republicans have outgrown their representation. In the first debate, the first question by NBC's Lester Holt dealt specifically with jobs and manufacturing and wanted to know specifically what each candidate would do to create more jobs in the U.S. What would you do? 
Well, Steve, uh, in the 2012 cycle, when I ran for president, uh, Rick Perry was beating his chest over the fact that he had created more jobs than anybody else running for president in 2012. And you know what? He did a really good job. But turns out, I actually had the best record when it came to jobs. And my response in 2012, same as it is today. Look, government doesn't create jobs. The private sector does. But I think I contributed mightily to this notion of equal opportunity. I vetoed a lot of legislation that was going to give advantage to those that already had advantage. Uh, government is for sale. Uh, crony capitalism is when government picks winners and losers. Well, if government doesn't pick winners and losers, then you have this equality by everyone. Everyone can equally compete. So what I'm offering is certainty. Taxes, is, uh, taxes are not going to go up. Rules and regulations are just going to get better. And, and I am not getting elected uh, dictator or king. I'm getting elected president of the United States. But I would advocate elimination of income tax and corporate tax, replacing those taxes with one federal consumption tax. I put out the uh, I, I put out there for your examination fair tax. Get on the internet, check out fair tax. It's been a proposal that's been around for about 10 years. Every year, about 80 congressmen and women sign on to it. It dots the I's and it crosses the T's on how you accomplish a one federal consumption tax. Bottom line, I think it would be fair. Bottom line, I think it would create tens of millions of jobs in this country because of a zero corporate tax. And let's not kid ourselves. You and I pay for corporate tax. Corporations don't pay for, their, for corporate tax. Let's go to Ted from Bedford, Virginia, supporter of Hillary Clinton. You're next. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call, hi. Governor Johnson. Uh, I've got to say, I'm a, I can't really call myself a Clinton supporter, but I will most certainly be voting for her. But I've got to say, uh, your humility and honesty are very refreshing. I really like it. Uh, my question is, uh, do you agree with the vast number of climate scientists, some 96 or 97 percent in, in every survey they do, that same number keeps up, um, that say that climate change is real and humans are causing it. Uh, first, do you agree with them, first of all? And yes, regardless. Yes. Of, re, re, OK, thank you. Uh, regardless of your question, <laughs> I'm sorry, I better written this down. Uh, <laughs> if we assume they are correct, what are your solutions to it? Does government have a role? Um, and if private enterprise is going to take care of it alone, how exactly would that work? That's pretty much my question. Thank you for taking it. Well, yeah. Always. Well, r right now, I think that uh, you and I as consumers are demanding less uh, carbon emission, and we're getting that. Uh, with regard to uh, World uh, uh, Paris Accord, for example, I don't see how it's achievable. I just, I really don't. Uh, I mean, I think it's set unrealistic goals. We're 16 percent of the uh, world's uh, carbon emission. Uh, carbon doesn't know any boundaries. So I don't want to get out front on this to the point that the U.S. loses jobs as a result of being out front on this. But I do think that consumers will drive uh, less carbon emission in a really big way. Uh, coal is a good example. Um, marginal coal assets have been bankrupted. Uh, the coal that is currently online is uh, supplying what is 36 percent of the current uh, U.S. electrical load. But why would you build a coal-fired plant today as low as the price of coal has been depressed, even lower is the price of natural gas. So why build a coal plant if you can build a natural gas plant for less money? Well, that's the market at work, and that is a cleaner planet. Let's turn to drugs. You've been a very vocal proponent of drug legalization. This is from David Lawson, who has a specific question on that. On that. He says, what would you say about your support for drug legalization to parents of children lost to drug addiction? 
Well, f first of all, the only drug that I have advocated legalizing, and this is since 1999, uh, being the highest elected uh, official in the United States to call for the legalization of marijuana, but the only, that's the only one that I'm calling for the legalization of is marijuana. I think we're going to do that as a country, and when we do that, I think we're going to come to a quantum leap of understanding when it comes to the drug issue. And that quantum leap will be to understand drugs first uh, as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. So when you talk about overdose, when you talk about death due to drugs, what we're concerned with is death, disease, crime, and corruption. And 90% of that is related to prohibition. Quality, quantity, unknown, dirty needles which lead to HIV, hepatitis C, the fact that it is legal, you know, you've got to indulge in prostitution, guns come out because disputes are played out with guns rather than the courts. So legalizing marijuana, then the big recognition, hey, it's a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. For all of those that have died due to overdose, um, look, it's, that's tragic, but it's quality, quantity, unknown. It's prohibition that kills. Do you find any benefits from using marijuana yourself personally? Well, I have. Uh, I have not had a drink of alcohol in 30 years. My life really is health and wellness. Comparing alcohol, though, to marijuana, uh, I think that marijuana is way safer than everything else that's out there, starting with alcohol. And I'd like to point out that the, that the campaign to legalize marijuana in Colorado, uh, the campaign was based on marijuana is safer than alcohol, which I believe that it is. But look, I begrudge no one taking the edge off of the day by consuming marijuana, nor do I begrudge anyone taking the edge off the day by consuming alcohol. It's just don't, don't take that impairment if you get impaired and get behind the wheel of a car. That's where government needs to have a role and will have a role. Look, uh, impairment is not an excuse uh, to do harm to someone else. Let's go to John, joining us from Phoenix, Arizona, supporter of Donald Trump. Good evening. Welcome to the program. Hi. I'd like to have any president, including you, <clears throat> that could answer the question regarding all the construction jobs that have been lost since the, uh, this housing market dived, um, why Americans have not on our construction sites. I do know why. Um, because of the fact that the new home builders are taking advantage of the fact that people are having to break the law. They're using W-9 forms to hire people to be on builder sites. And then 90% um, 90 90 of the people that are filling out this form turns into a 1099 at the end of the year, and IRS collects these forms, and they're fake. 90% of them are using fake Social Security numbers. These are thousands of jobs on our construction sites being lost, and I'm wondering why no president has talked about all the jobs that are lost by the middle class through new home builders that are taking advantage of the fact that laws are being enforced, not being enforced, and we're losing our jobs. John, thank you. Well, f first of all, I don't know if you know my history, but I uh, started a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque in 1974 and actually grew that business to employ over a thousand people. Uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, pipe fitting. Uh, some of the best workers that I had were uh, immigrants. Um, and, I main and I maintain that. I also maintain that it's not an issue of lower pay unless it's an issue of language, and they're the first ones that recognize that. They're taking jobs that U.S. citizens don't want. You rightfully describe the uh, hoop jumping that goes on with uh, false documentation that they present to get these jobs. I'd like to see work visas issued, make this, make this something that's upfront, that it doesn't have to be um, illegal. Uh, but uh, a great untold story also is, is that uh, 
these taxes get collected from uh, immigrants that uh, are presenting false documentation and the taxes are never collected. Uh, so they are contributing to the system in a big way and not actually taking uh, advantage of what they're paying into. Governor Johnson, another question from the first presidential debate dealt with income inequality and pointing out that many Americans are living from paycheck to paycheck. So what could you do? What is the role of government to boost the income of the American people and the tax code in this country that may help the American people and also to the earlier point about creating jobs? Well, so Steve, something that I always want, I, I want to give people the following advice. And, and the advice I have to give is, is that take whatever it is that you know and apply it entrepreneurially. Create your own job. Create jobs for others. Well, uh, there's probably a collective scoff at that because of how difficult it is to do that. Well, government can play a role in making that uh, a lot easier. So if what people are looking for is income equality, Peter taking from Paul, I don't know if government is going to ever be able to step in and make that equitable. But if people are looking for equal opportunity, where you can compete um, equally with somebody else, and I think a great example of that right now is the internet. Look, uh, as individuals, all of us are on par with every single other individual on the planet because of the Internet. I, I think the um, model for the future is Uber everything. It's eliminating the middleman. It's allowing you as the entrepreneur to deliver your goods and services to the end user. End user pays less money because there's not a middleman. You, as the provider of goods and services, you end up to make more money because there's not a middleman. I do, think, I do think this is the model of the future. And there are assaults uh, by government, by uh, legislation. Uh, Hillary, wants, uh, Hillary does not want to see uh, Uber, doesn't want to see Airbnb. I was talking to a young lady in Baltimore who got her PhD in science. She said, I have these horrendous student debts. I figured out a way to pay for them. I started renting out my place, Airbnb. But the city of Baltimore stepped in and said, nope, can't do it, not allowed. Well, that's government standing in the way of what I think is just the tip of the iceberg of the sharing economy uh, that's out there. Get government. Get government out of the equation. Government plays a role. Health, safety, equality, making sure that no one harms anyone else. In that context, though, government can also ensure that I'm on par with everybody else. I'm not at a disadvantage because um, I've, never, I've never attempted to do something. We'll go to Katie, one of your supporters. She's joining us from Navron, Pennsylvania. You're next. Hey, Gary. Uh, hey. One, one of the main complaints that I hear about your campaign is that you're not more open to combating environmental issues. Um, are you willing to consider opening your mind to this and specifically how so or on what grounds? You're, you're saying that I'm not open to combating environmental issues? I support the EPA. I think, uh, I think government has a fundamental role to protect us against individuals, groups, corporations, foreign governments that would do us harm. And I put pollution in the category of harm. I put the EPA as kind of a forefront of protecting us against polluters. In New Mexico, as governor of New Mexico, there was a major uh, polluter of a uh, river in northern New Mexico, that pollution, metals contamination, mining enterprise had gone on for decades. Uh, they refused to acknowledge that they were even responsible uh, for uh, the metals contamination in the first place. Um, I shut them down because my biggest anvil was the Environmental Protection Agency and Look, if you're not going to come to the table uh, in 30 days, I'm going to turn you over to federal EPA and you're going to become a super fun site. And that's exactly what happened. So I'd like to think that, um, yeah, I, I'm going to stand up against uh, 
polluters and uh, I believe in uh, the health and safety of you and I as citizens of this country and health and safety. Look, uh, pollution flies in the face of uh, health and safety. Gary Johnson is a graduate of the University of New Mexico. He served as the governor of that state from 1995 until 2003. This next topic has been the most tweeted topic over the last hour. It deals with education and college costs. This is from Adam, who says, what is your proposal to deal with the rising cost of universities and student loan debt? Well, I think that the main reason for the high cost of college tuition is guaranteed government student loans. If guaranteed government student loans never would have existed, college tuition today, I believe, would be half of what it is right now. So government has interjected itself, picking winners and losers, winners in this case, colleges and universities that are absolutely immune from having to price their products uh, in a way that if you didn't have a guaranteed government student loan, you'd stand back and really question the aff affordability of college and ultimately the prices, like I say, would be much lower. I think students have been sold a bill of goods when it comes to uh, student loans uh, and that they are graduating from college with a home mortgage without the home. Uh, I'd be open to legislation that would fix the interest rates uh, uh, in line with the bailout from Wall Street. Uh, uh, believing that this is a catastrophe that's looming out there. And doing away with guaranteed government student loans isn't going to do away with student loans. It's just going to put it over on the private sector. And if you did all that, um, college tuitions would drop dramatically. Quick question from another viewer with regard to 2020, four years from now, wondering if you don't make it in this election, would you consider running again? No, I think I've been given a really uh, a good shot here, and uh, there's still the possibility of, uh, of making this happen. Uh, like I say, this C-SPAN appearance right now, if this doesn't do it, I don't know what will. But uh, no, I, I've been given my shot. 2012, 1.3 million votes, 1%. Momentum has continued. Momentum is really pretty darn straight up, and in uh, spite of all the odds, uh, we're in there. We're contending at the moment. But uh, 2020, I think there'll be a slew of libertarian candidates that, uh, that will come along that will um, really be exciting. And I'll look forward to that. But I'll look forward to that as, a, uh, uh, as an observer and not a participant. We have wanted to focus primarily on public policy issues in this campaign, but two political questions. First, your running mate, Governor Bill Weld, saying he wants to do whatever he can to make sure that Donald Trump is not elected. Is he doing enough to help you in this election to make a dent in 2016? Oh, absolutely. Bill Weld, uh, you know, uh, before we got together uh, running as uh, uh, a ticket here for the Libertarian Party, we were pretty good friends. We're best friends now. I. I hold Bill Weld up on a pedestal and that he wants to keep Donald Trump from being president. He wants to keep Donald Trump from being president as much as I don't want to see Hillary Clinton as president. So we have a pretty balanced ticket. And former Congressman uh, Ron Paul, who was the 1988 Libertarian nominee, said that Jill Stein is more progressive than you. What would you say to Congressman Paul? Well, that's, uh, that's Congressman Paul's... Um, I, progressive uh, on the social side, uh, economically, I think that, uh, I think Jill and I agree on a whole lot of topics, but I think when it comes to economics, uh, Jill and I come to a T in the road, and uh, if, if what uh, Ron Paul is saying is that she's more progressive on social issues, well, that's his opinion. If she's saying she's better on the issues uh, from an economic standpoint, I'd be surprised if he were saying that. Let's go to David, joining us from Bell, California, supporter of Hillary Clinton. Good evening. Hi, Governor Johnson. I'm actually I've never been registered for any political party. That, that's how I've conducted myself as a citizen. And um, I'm a little concerned. At the beginning of the show, the um, host asked you about who would you appoint, for example, uh, as a foreign secretary. I think that's a pretty important question to ask. And I don't, I don't know if your answer was sufficient. Now, I'm supporting Hillary Clinton this year because I trust her. I obviously don't support 
Trump. I trust you on social issues, but I'm not sure that's good enough to get me to vote for you. And I could totally vote for you, given that I live in a in a county where the Democratic Party is going to win it, hands down. Now, let me ask you two questions. What's your position on the inheritance tax and why? And then as it relates to foreign policy, how would you, for example, deal with a president, Rodrigo Duterte, who's antagonizing the United States? Thank you. Thank you, David. Two points. Well, I think uh, uh, the latter question, Philippine president, um, I, I think he's going to see a greatly diminished uh, tourist trade with the United States. That's just my guess. Uh, and that unless he, uh, unless he um, adjusts his dialogue or people get him out of office, uh, I think the Philippines will suffer as a result of uh, tourism dropping in Philippines. That's just, that's just my pr uh, prediction. And the things that he is doing from a human rights standpoint, I would stand up uh, to what he is doing from a human rights standpoint uh, and this crackdown on drugs resulting in the deaths of, of a whole lot of people. So uh, I would certainly, uh, I, I'd certainly engage in, a, in, a, in the dialogue against uh, what he is doing if I were elected president of the United States. And um, back to uh, Hillary and uh, the inheritance look, tax. Um, oh, inheritance tax. Thank you. So inheritance tax. I, I think it's one of those um, issues where um, lower middle class. Uh, I, I realize that for the most part they're able to um, pass that money on because of the limits that do exist. Uh, but ideally, uh, we would not have that tax. Ideally. Uh, if we were to eliminate income tax and corporate tax and replace all of it with one federal consumption tax, we would not have a deduction for Social Security. We would not have a deduction for unemployment. We would not have a deduction for Medicaid. Uh, and the inheritance tax would go by the wayside and all those other, uh, all of that, those other revenues would come from the proceeds of one federal consumption tax. We'll get one more call. This is from Ricky in DeSoto, Missouri. Good evening. Hi. Um, so this is, uh, well, good evening, Mr. Johnson, to you as well. Um, I'm 19 years old, and I'm very open-minded, But and this is my first presidential election that I can partake in. And I must say this election is an insult to human intelligence. The United States government is using our love for the land against us to create problems in our own homes. We're force-fed information in schools, and then kids have to compete on standardized tests to be graded like me. I think the minds of the youth are the backbone to our planet's existence. It seems as if the youth have had absolutely no say in high political positions for important subjects involving our home and well-being. Do you have anything in mind on how the youth can be eventually involved into government? Well, uh, I do, and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll point out the obvious here is that young people, you know, 18 through 34, have only grown up with the Internet. My generation, uh, other older generations, have grown up uh, seeing everything through a filter. Because you haven't seen anything through a filter, um, I think you really kind of cut through the clutter more than any other group. I'm believing that's the case because uh, I'm tied for the lead among your demographic. I'm hoping that's the case. So young people have really been sold or are being, or <laughs> right now the attempt is to sell you all a bill of goods. Expanding Medicaid and Medicare, doing nothing when it comes to Social Security, continuing a foreign policy that puts you in harm's way. Uh, I think you're bearing the brunt of all of this, and all of this is going to come to a crashing uh, conclusion because we just simply cannot continue to print money uh, to cover things that we can't pay for. The horrible tax at the end of all of this, the breakdown, will be just a whiplash inflation, that the money that you've saved will be worth an incredible... <laughs> The money you've saved will be worth a much lower amount, literally, overnight, because that is how this is going to manifest itself. A lot more money chasing same goods and services is going to result in much, much higher prices, 
And that's the demise of most, uh, most countries uh, like ourselves. We have a chance here to deal with it, but let's deal with it. It's not an option to say, let's do nothing. It's not an option to expand these programs. Let me conclude with this question for you personally. What is a bigger challenge, running for president or scaling Mount Everest? <laughs> Steve, I think they're, uh, they're one in the same. It's one foot in front of the other and going to Everest and actually getting to the summit. Look, getting to the summit was going to be a real plus, but being there, being fit enough, uh, being in a position, staying safe, working your way. Look, there are a lot of factors beyond your control, but that I was there and was actually uh, successful in that endeavor. It was a process. Running for president is a process. It's the same thing. One foot in front of the other. Life is all about dealing with failure. How we deal with failure ultimately determines success. Do you crawl up in a ball, declare yourself a victim, or do you get up the next day with a smile on your face, recognizing that it is a process? I'm the latter. I wake up every day with a smile. It's a process. Setbacks are, are what we deal with all the time. Just, let's just deal with them. Joining, I deal with them. Joining us from Santa Fe, New Mexico this last hour, former Governor Gary Johnson, the 2016 Libertarian nominee, Governor, thank you for being with us here on C-SPAN. We appreciate it. Steve, thank you very much. When we come back, we'll turn our attention to the Green Party nominee and her running mate here in Washington, D.C. to take your calls and another hour looking at two of the leading third-party candidates in this election. We're back in a moment. C-SPAN's Washington Journal, live every day with news and policy issues that impact you. Coming up Wednesday morning, Larry Sabato, director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, discusses his crystal ball predictions for electoral college votes and key Senate and House races. Then frontline correspondent Martin Smith talks about his documentary on the fight against ISIS. The documentary focuses on the successes, failures, and challenges. And author Nicole Hemmer will be on to talk about her new book that explores the historical connection between candidates and the conservative media and the future of conservatism. Be sure to watch C-SPAN's Washington Journal, live at 7 Eastern, Wednesday morning. Join the discussion 